the other end. Three more. Davis. When the 1991 basketball season began, head coach Joey Meyer didn't quite know what to expect from his DePaul Blue Demons. This club would showcase its experienced veterans, but there was also vibrant new talent hoping to burst onto the colorful scene of college basketball. Expectations were high, and Meyer would be faced with the task of being both chess player and psychologist. There were many questions facing DePaul, and there was only one way to find the answers. Welcome to Memphis and the brand new pyramid hard by the banks of the Mississippi River. Tonight, the scene of the inaugural game of the Great Midwest Conference. The DePaul season opened with an unenviable trip to Memphis, Tennessee, where they and Memphis State would open the brand new Great Midwest Conference in style. A national television audience would witness the unveiling of the Tigers' brand new pyramid, a 20,000 seat tomb of doom. For the Blue Demons, it would be a baptism by fire. Going into that first game, we really didn't know what to expect because it was the first conference game in the history of the school. Um, it was the first game in that building, in the pyramid, 20,000 fans, uh, the ESPN. It's really, it was hard to know exactly what to expect. And I think we probably got kind of what we really in the end expected, and that was kind of a wild game. Kleinschmidt with a steal, and Kleinschmidt lays it up. Knocked away. What a save by Madlock. Hardaway for three. For 40 minutes, DePaul and Memphis State went at each other with the fury found in a game more likely to be played in March than November. When freshman Howard Nathan hit two free throws with 16 seconds remaining, DePaul led by three and was seemingly headed toward victory. There he goes. To play. The season was not yet one game old, and DePaul was already headed for its first overtime. It was time for the Blue Demon seniors to rise to the occasion. Barry Davis. Oh. Oh. Jeff Stern with a follow. Oh. Stern coming up there. Here comes Nathan. Oh. 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 Joe Doherty for three. DePaul seniors combined for 11 of 13 overtime points and won not only against the Tigers, but against the pressure as well. To go in there and win the first game of the year, I, I thought it was a big, big time win, and, and our first conference win, and, and to beat a team that ended up in the final eight with that kind of talent, that was a tremendous start to the season. From that Memphis State game on, freshman Howard Nathan proved he was ready for college basketball. Nathan was the catalyst for DePaul's success all season long. Though his numbers may have been modest, his play was anything but. Nathan, good play by Rogers, but look at Nathan again, and a no look to Howard. Nathan led DePaul in steals in 92 and was second in assists. He was named freshman All-American and earned all great Midwest newcomer honors. Howard also showed that keen court vision that every point guard needs to have. Like he's Shaking done for up. a contact, maybe. Yeah, he is. Howard Nathan <laughs> sitting on the bench. Don't take. Do not what? tell me he saw the contact. He, he came running out all the way from the bench. Tom Kleinschmidt was by no means DePaul's other freshman in 92. The 6'5 forward saw action in 28 games, starting three. Kleinschmidt scored 18 points against North Carolina State and 17 in a victory over American. Tom was third on the team in assists in 92, and he was the team's sixth leading rebounder. During the first three weeks of December, the Blue Demons took a sabbatical from their Rosemont Horizon home and traveled back in time. Three games played at their tiny on-campus arena, Alumni Hall. Three games, three blowouts. Inside for the oh, for the slam. Oh, my goodness. Doherty. Both for the slam. Northeastern, American, and Northern Illinois all fell victim as the Blue Demons rolled behind a three-game average of nearly 100 points. Preseason expectations were coming true. The demons were rolling. 
Nearing mid-January, DePaul reached a crossroads. With four games in eight days, it would be a week that could make or break the season. When Memphis State took the horizon floor on January 11th, one thing was certain. The Tigers wanted revenge and would stop at nothing to get it. But from the opening tip, the Blue Demons had a message for Memphis. Not today. This is Stephen Howard right away, up and in. DePaul, behind 25 points from David Booth and 20 by Terry Davis, cruised to an 88-80 victory. One game down, but three more yet to go. A trip to Detroit to take on the Titans is never an easy task, and this is what DePaul faced on Monday the 13th. Despite the cold outside, the inside of Cobo Arena was heating up thanks to a dominating performance by DePaul's big men. 17 points by Stephen Howard and 16 from Jeff Stern led DePaul to an easy 92-81 victory. Just two days later, the Cincinnati Bearcats invaded the horizon for a first place showdown in the great Midwest. The Bearcats were out to lay claim to the conference lead. Only they forgot to tell DePaul about it. Inside, Klein Schmidt's got an easy one. Nice pass from The Demons took it to the heart of the Cincinnati defense and touched off a parade to the free throw line where they made 27 of 32 shots. Howard scored 21 points and Booth added 17. But it was the three point shooting of Howard Nathan and Joe Doherty that would ultimately bring down these stubborn Bearcats. Nathan gonna pull up for three and he hit it. Three point shot, nailed it. DePaul went on to win 75-66. They had taken the first three games of this treacherous swing and only one mighty hurdle stood between them and perfection. On the afternoon of Saturday, January 18th, the Rosemont Horizon crowd swelled to capacity and bubbled with anticipation. John Thompson and Alonzo Mourning led the Georgetown Hoyas onto the Horizon floor. Days earlier, DePaul had reestablished itself in the conference. Today, the Blue Demons would reestablish themselves in the eyes of a nation. Mourning was no match for the balance of DePaul's attack. Seven players scored, and behind 22 points from David Poole, DePaul won 72-62. They had taken the Hoyas apart and completed this pivotal week without losing a single game. To get four wins when you're six and five, really getting in the meat of your conference, uh, I, I think that was probably the most important week. Uh, and I know it was the most important week of the season and one of the more important weeks DePaul's had in a while and to end up that week 10 and 5 really showed everybody that DePaul had turned it around and they were going to be a factor this year. After sitting out his freshman season, Brandon Cole burst onto the scene as DePaul's sharp shooting sophomore. Cole's forte was the three-point shot and nearly half his total field goals were from beyond the arc. Cole scored nine points against North Carolina State, had 10 in the Northeastern victory, and scored a career-high 13 points with six rebounds against American. Mike Ravizzi was a player everyone wanted to see in 91-92. Ravizzi lost 60 pounds in the offseason and was eager to strut his stuff on the court. It was no coincidence that when the weight came down, the playing time went up. Ravizzi saw action in 18 games, including a starting assignment in the season opener at Memphis. Ravizzi scored six points against Loyola Marymount and was instrumental in a victory over UAB at the horizon. As the end of February approached, the Blue Demons were faced with quite possibly the toughest three-game stretch in school history. Starting Sunday, February 16th, Louisville at the horizon on national TV. I'm Brad Musburger. Nice to have you along with this one. DePaul, one of the hottest teams in the country right now. They've won nine of the last ten unbeaten here in this building this year. Denny Crum's Cardinals are historically tough down the stretch, but this was a game DePaul absolutely had to have. And to win it, they would unveil a new offensive weapon. By Price. The final 747 of this one, Howard. Oh, short and a put back by Price. Inspired by his ailing father, Curtis Price exploded for a season-high 14 points and six rebounds to head an emotionally charged 84-81 victory. Four days later, it was on to Cincinnati where the Bearcats and their fans were waiting, 13,000 strong. It was billed as the game of the year in the great Midwest Conference, and the two teams were more than happy to oblige. There's a dish turtle finish. Bannix will try to keep the streak alive and does. The Bearcats were seemingly in command, leading by 11 points with just over four minutes to play, when DePaul unleashed a dynamo, freshman Howard Nathan. Nathan forced it up there and got it to go. That's a three-pointer. Hubert goes. 
around Weinschmidt, but then Nathan takes it away. Gordy, he'll in control at the other end. Booth picks it up, and it's a tie game. A deadly combination of Nathan's defense and David Booth's offense tied the game at 69 apiece. And with only 16 seconds left, Nathan's free throws gave DePaul a two-point lead. But the freshman's bag of tricks wasn't quite closed yet. And it's stripped away by Nathan. They throw it the length of the floor. DePaul is going to win. Miraculously, DePaul had won and clinched the first ever championship in the great Midwest Conference. Following the emotional Cincinnati game, DePaul took its road show to the Florida Suncoast Dome, where 16th ranked Florida State and another national television audience were waiting. Time for a letdown? Think again. Nathan hits Booth will take the three. Wow. Why not? Let him shoot the rock, baby. Behind 16 first half points by David Booth, DePaul led by two at halftime. As the second half began, the lead had grown, but just when victory seemed inevitable, disaster struck. Fell down hard. With their scoring leader sideline, the Blue Demons clinging to the lead would need someone to step to the forefront. Snap inside to Howard, couldn't get the handle, but again, Davis is right there, and he'll go for the pull-up. That's two field goals for Terry Davis after David Booth left with the injury. Davis got Howard on the inside. Oh, what a great catch. Hey, Davis and Howard have really excelled here with Booth on the sideline. Stephen Howard and Terry Davis had answered the call. Howard led DePaul, scoring 27 points. Davis scored 23. The Blue Demons had swept this three-game stretch, and the nation's top 20 was waiting. When you look back in retrospect, that was a three-game stretch that I don't know very many teams would have won all three. And it really put us in the top 15 in the country, let people know that DePaul had not only held for it and turned the corner to be a good team, could be a very good basketball team. To say Terry Davis had a solid junior season would be a vast understatement. Davis was DePaul's most consistent performer in 1992, starting all 29 games while scoring in double figures in 26. Davis could play defense as well, often guarding the opposing team's leading scorer. Curtis Price started 15 games for DePaul in 92, and of those 15, DePaul won 13. Price's trademark was simple, defensive intensity. Curtis was DePaul's fifth leading rebounder, and his 22 block shots were second only to Jeff Stern. In the final home game of 1992, DePaul played host to the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. It would be the final time DePaul's five seniors would appear before the Horizon crowd. The game was a classic. And into the front court with a minute five to play. Stolen by Nathan! Howard Nathan! DePaul leads! While David Booth continued to rest his sore ankle, Stephen Howard's career-high 31 points, including a final clutch free throw, gave DePaul a 66-65 victory, the Demons' 20th of the season. David Booth would finish his career as DePaul's second all-time leading scorer. After four years, his name is prominently displayed across DePaul's record book. In 1992, Booth earned all Midwest honors and was named first team all great Midwest. For the last four years, Stephen Howard has dominated the low post for the Blue Demons. He finished his DePaul career ranked in the top five in both scoring and rebounding and was named a first team academic All-American as well as first team All-Great Midwest. Joe Doherty was a tri-captain for the Blue Demons in his final season. Doherty finished his career as DePaul's 11th all-time assist leader and sixth leading three-point shooter. Doherty started all 29 games for DePaul, leading the team in assists 18 times. No DePaul center in the last five years has dominated defensively the way Jeff Stern did in two years as a Blue Demon. Stern blocked 57 shots in 92, and his 123 career blocks ranks fifth on the all-time list. Stern also had a career-high 20 points this year in a victory over St. Louis. Despite sitting out his senior year with injury, Brad Neiman's name is etched in the DePaul record books as well. Neiman ranks as DePaul's single season and career record holder for three-point field goals. On Sunday, March 15th, DePaul achieved its season-long goal when the NCAA tournament extended an invitation, complete with a number five seed, a reward well-deserved for what was an outstanding basketball season. It was, as I say, sometimes a roller coaster year with how it started so high, then we slumped in December, and then we came back exceedingly strong, improved what type of team we were, and then we had some injuries that kind of left us. 
a little bit lower than we would have liked to, but when you look back at the year, these seniors and this team has a lot to be proud of. The ball is tipped, there you are. You're running for your life. You play shooting star and all the years. No one knows just how hard you worked. But now it shows in one shining moment you reached deep inside. One shining moment you knew you were alive. Feel the beat of your heart, feel the wind in your face. It's more than a contest, it's more. Shine!